So welcome everybody. Uh, this is, uh, once again, is, is one, a, a new edition of Language for the Professions. Uh, and today we have two speakers. I'm going to introduce the first one of them, who is uh, here already. Um, so she's Oria Simonini, and I'm going to read from the, from the flyers that you guys got. Uh, Oria Simonini is a Latinx artist based in, in Omaha, who received her Bachelor of Fine Arts from UNL in December of 2018. Uh, born in French Guyana uh, to Argentine parents, uh, her paintings and murals explore migration and the complex dialogue between the migrant and non-migrant experiences. Uh, she has shown in uh, several galleries in Nebraska and was recently awarded the Populous Fund by the Union for Contemporary Arts. Uh, Oria, what I, what I was thinking is that uh, you can start you know, kind of what we have discussed, right? You can start telling us uh, your trajectory and, and how it, it was linked to language. Um, and then I was thinking that that if uh, the second speaker arrives, then we talk, uh, then she talks. And then I was thinking of doing a, a Q and A for the two of you. Sounds uh, good. Sounds good. Uh, yeah. But for, for now you are the, the, the one speaker who is here. So let's start with you okay. and then if, if she doesn't come, then we, we ask you our questions, okay? Sounds good, sounds All good. All right, thank you, Aria. Um, yeah, thanks for the, the introduction. Um, I guess sort of a little bit about me, we, um, my family had a very sort of international, my life had a very international start and languages were always linked with that. Having um, had Spanish speaking parents, but my, my parents always spoke, um, as well like French and Italian. I was born in a French speaking country, although I don't really remember it. But um, what I do remember was that, you know, growing up in a boat, there was always a lot of travelers. Um, my, we later, when I was two, we, we started living in Guatemala in an area that was like a hurricane safe zone for sailboats and also like an area that a lot of people just traveled. Um, as tourists. So I do have always had a memory of like hearing many languages and that my parents were always like um, pretty clear about how powerful that was to speak languages, just to communicate with people, not necessarily like being perfectly fluent. And sometimes it's not even, you know, to your, always to your benefit. My parents, um, always uh there's this like funny an anecdote um I was born in French Guiana so it was French territory but the people living there didn't like the French so my mom both my parents spoke French but my mom spoke a very um like I would say like a high French and my dad who um <laughs> just like his English he sort of gets by with the language he can communicate but you can tell he's not you know that it's his that he's learning that language um, and so then when they would go to like the markets, for instance, like if my mom spoke and asked for the price of tomatoes, she got the price for French speaking people. But if my dad asked for the tomatoes, he got like the better local price. So I, I remember as a kid, just, I feel like knowing that was important. Um, my memory, I, I spoke only Spanish until I was around seven. I don't have any memory of learning English. I don't remember. I just like blocked it out. Um, I do have a memory of my mom trying to teach me English before we came to the U.S. Um, but that's all I rem that's all I have. So I think my brain was always like there was always two two languages, Spanish and English, um, and there was always an importance of like speaking. Spanish, never losing it, even though I grew up and like all my education is mainly in English, but I did take um, like Spanish or Spanish speakers in high school. I took a Spanish class in college. I started, I started learning um, German in college as well and did a study abroad in Germany. So um, it was, yeah, it's always been a, a really important thing. I didn't study languages, I studied art. And um, I didn't really think 
too much of it. I just knew that it's, it never hurts to speak another language. So I didn't really, I could have studied more, but I did I, more languages, but I didn't. And, um, and currently I'm sort of um, like in my profession, well, as an art, as, a, as an artist and someone who works with um, communities with a migrant experience, um, who's interested in sort of relationships between um, people who live in different places and, and also like our own community and all the different cultures and people who live here and who make who are part of you know our community. It's 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 always really important that I I speak in Spanish or that you try and um, I don't know communicate with people. It doesn't you know and that English can be used however it needs to be used. Um, it doesn't have to be a perfect English or a perfect Spanish or a perfect German. Um, and as I've like worked with, um, I'm really interested in, in art, the art movements here in Mexico, um, in Colombia, there's a lot of like public art and art that happens on the street that's really made as a protest and as communication directly with, with the people and not with like <clears throat> institutions. It's helped me that I speak Spanish because I can relate to, to a lot of, of um, yeah, people who are who I admire and who are working in in, in things that I I'd love to be involved with. Um, I think I mean, did I cover everything, Jose? Is there anything you'd like me to mention? <laughs> um, you you have talked right. It sounds like you have talked about your childhood and how you started one language and and the next one. Um, but I, I was wondering if you maybe could talk a bit more uh, about your education in, like, in, U, in UNL um, okay. and, and also your once you started uh, working after, after um, your education. Sure, yeah. Um, at UNL, I studied main, I mean, I was an art major, so I was in mainly art classes. Um, I did take a few Spanish. I always had the hope of taking a, a class that would do the same thing that um, I ended up figuring out all I needed to do was like live in a Spanish speaking country for like three months. But I always searched for like a advanced level Spanish class that would do that for me. But um, so I didn't have like the best experiences in Spanish classes, but I tried. And then um, I did have like almost a, a German minor and um, and then after that, I always like throughout school and even after school, um, I worked in restaurants. So there was always a presence of um, a lot of Mexican, Salvador, Honduras, uh, people from there working in the kitchen. But I also worked in a lot of um, like Japanese, Chinese, Korean um, environments. So I like, you know, there was always that sort of language influence um and then as I yeah like I said it being an artist you can't like work full-time at the beginning so you do a lot of odd jobs I taught English in Spain for a while in Valencia and that was really um an interesting experience it was really hard <laughs> kudos to you to to language professors because I I tapped out <laughs> Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that, um, I think that one of the things that in my experience in Spain and just like teaching English is as an English speaker, there's like so much, so much power in that because we live in a sort of in a, in a structure that values English over everything else. And, um, what was really interesting is to see like in Spain, like I was teaching like five-year-olds to people who are like 60 and we're still and they were like there's like this like struggle but also it feels a little forced it's like like you know you have to go to the you, like it was it was an interesting um experience and I think it's one that goes back to like yeah an over valuing of like western and English being like this power yeah 
symbol of power. So um, were, were you teaching in Spain as a, um, uh, what do they call it there, uh, assistente de conversación, conversation assistant? No, uh, I, I was teaching in like a language academy. So I was doing, I was just like teaching classes with another um, British guy. And I was there because I was a, a Spanish, I'm sorry, a English native speaker. But um, I unfortunately didn't have a lot of training and I wasn't coming with a super confident background of teaching English. So there was a lot of hurdles and there was a lot of um, people who were going to classes, like kids who were going to classes, going to school, studying English and coming after school to take more English classes, all aimed at taking the Cambridge exams. So it was a lot of, it was a lot of confusion, <laughs> but, but also it was a great experience. <laughs> Um, another question that I'm thinking of, um, so you, you have worked with artists uh, from Mexico, if I remember correctly, um, mm -hmm. among other places. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention that Oria is actually presenting or, or, or talking to us from Mexico City right now. Um, <laughs> so, you know, this links perfectly to the, to the question. So how do you think that because being bilingual, being an artist doesn't have to go together, but how do you think that made things different or how do you think that open up, open up opportunities for you as an artist to be as a, an artist? A, 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 a Spanish speaker? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think being bilingual and bicultural and having like um, sort of that experience of, sh of going from one to the other, um, not only has helped me usually like in all my like interpersonal relationships, I'm pretty good with getting along with people, but um, there's a difference, like, like I said, being able to communicate in the language with the person that you want is so, is so powerful. And um, when you're even, you know, even if I, if, if my Spanish was at maybe a lower level or had more difficult with it, um, I would still be connecting with, with the artists or with the people around me in a way that is meaningful. And, you know, it's, it's like anything else, like connections or like, oh, you're working on this type of project. I know another artist who's doing this or there's a free wall, you know, we can paint here and all those things um, just happen. And it's really much harder if I didn't speak Spanish or if I wasn't able to communicate my interests or, or, or yeah, create friendships or just simply say like, hey, I'm interested in painting, <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, you especially, know, mm -hmm. oh. No, no, please, please go ahead, go ahead. Oh, and I was just saying, especially like um, communities that like, like people who work in it, who, who it, it, it's kind of hard. Like, I don't want to say graffiti. I don't want to say public art murals, like work, like, works in the street it ends up being like a really really small community so once like and everyone connects everyone so once you connect with you know a certain amount of people in Mexico then you also have connections through them in all over the world because it's such a small it's like such a small group that everyone has benefit from someone being like oh my friend can help you out in Austria they're there painting mm -hmm. so that's also like really really valuable um, um, I actually got a, a question here in the chat, which I, sure. also for, I also forgot to mention to everyone. Uh, as we are talking, you guys can already start uh, putting questions in the in the chat, and I will be asking them uh, to to Oria. Uh, so yeah, the the one question I got here is kind of the opposite of what I just asked you. In what ways do you think that those collaborations with other other artists would have been more limited? if you were not a, a bilingual or a multilingual person? How, how would they have been more limited? Yes. If you were a monolingual speaker in just one language, uh, how that could have been, could have made some parts of your career different? Maybe not more difficult, maybe just different. Yeah, I think it would, it, it would have been like inherently different just because um, 
I probably would be making work that's about other things. I don't really know what, but being bilingual and bicultural and like having traveled a lot in my life, I'm really interested in communities and movement and what, how all these affects us, how we affect, you know, you, yeah. I mean, I don't know, it would be totally different. I'm not sure how, mm -hmm. what it would look like, I guess, um, maybe it would be the same, but um, I would probably have to have spent more time truly understanding what that experience is rather than having come with it already. Um, yeah but yeah the thing about I mean, making mm -hmm. oh no no yeah, I, I, about... I, I, yeah, yeah please go ahead <laughs> we, we we seem to have a delay it's delay. okay it's like tag i mean, i was just saying the thing about making art is that it's it's like it, they're all just questions and you're thinking about you and your relationship to others or your relationship to time or you know so it it yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, when when you when we were cutting each other, I was just I was just uh, a, I was I guess just summarizing your your thought, right? That if you were not a bicultural by by uh, and bilingual person, then you can understand it, but you cannot live it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Okay, so I, I don't mean to put you on the spot here because I don't know if you can do this with, with uh, your iPad and I don't know if we can do this uh, on, on the Zoom side either. But do you think, do you have any, maybe any art that you can show us and tell us how that biculturalism is shown? How, what was the last part? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I was thinking, I don't know if it's possible, for you to, I don't know, sharing your screen. I don't know how we could do this. Um, if you could show us some of the art that you do and how the your biculturalism is shown there. Mm. I don't even know if you can share a screen, actually. Let me see. I like, let me see. I could try. I believe you should be able to share a screen. If if you think this is doable, if, if you think this complicates things. I mean, I could talk about it. I I could. Okay, we can do that. Let's let's do that. I, yeah, I'm trying. Wait, let me. I'm trying to 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 problem solve because I have pictures. Unless, do you want to, uh, Jose? Do you want to just go on my website and you share the screen? Okay, we can do that. Let me see. The website is uh, Simonini Ori or Oria? Oria Simonini, just. Dot com? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me see here. Do you guys see the website? I can, yes. Uh, anyone, uh, everybody else, can you guys tell us what you guys see? You should see her website. Claudia goes like that, so I think I think we're good. Cool. All right. Um, so actually, this one is a really, um, I'm pretty excited about this project, so I can talk about it. And it's another reason why I'm here. So um, these like pictures here, the Skylar Community Mural, and um, this is like, I got a grant from the Union for Contemporary Art for this project. And it's um, essentially like two sister murals. So one mural is done in Schuyler, Nebraska, and other one will be done in Guatemala here in a few weeks. And um, the basis of it is that we offer, so it's myself and two artists who are based, who are Guatemalan, who are based in Guatemala. And so we offer a free workshop where um, we sort of invite community members um, to participate and we kind of ask them, um, we have this theme of like changes and like personal stories and sort of like what they wanted to see in their community. And we were doing it all um, in Spanish and in English uh, because Skylar is, has, a, has a really large um, 
migrant like population that's migrant and a lot of them are from central and and mexico um although not they also have like african and they just have a variety of of um cultures living there but so um so we did that and then the, the drawings that you can see the images on the mural are are the drawings that the people made and we just kind of collaged everything and um, got it on the wall and everyone painted it. So I think that the idea came because I had lived in Guatemala and I was um, and like over the past years, you know, like as, as the people have been migrating up to North America a lot. So I was just like, oh, this person left and this person left. So there is like, a personal connection of, of knowing that people ha are making that trip as well as like living in places where um, we benefit from people who are who are processing meat like Skylar had a really um, like in, in the pandemic with the meat packing plants and like mm -hmm. the labor abuse so that's still part of our you know reality and we're living with these things so um yeah, I think that it was, for me, it was interesting to create like a, a work of art that had two physical spaces and that those physical spaces were creating like a small conversation maybe between strangers, but through like similar experiences because anyone who leaves like their home country leaves family there. And so we're like continuously, you know, we're having all of these circular relationships between countries and places. I mean, much like my own experience with my family in Argentina and family in Guatemala and family in Italy. So it's, it's like a, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so what, we, what we see here is what you guys already did in Skylar. So yeah, you can see this in Skylar. The Guatemalan part of the project is uh, being done, has been done. Um, It's going to be done, hopefully. Cross my fingers the first week of March. <laughs> All right. Sounds yeah. Good. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's. Um, I'm just trying to think where. where maybe we, studio work 2022. Studio work? Does anyone yeah. have any questions? Yeah. And these are like my own, like my smaller paintings that mm -hmm. I, um, a lot of times, based on like news um, and web source imagery. Uh, all relevant with like migrant experience. Yeah. Let me see the chat really quick. I'm not sure how we are doing on questions because when uh, when I'm sharing my screen, it's harder for oh, me to see. Oh, let me see if I can participate. Yeah, so we have a, a question from Claudia Garcia. I don't know if you know her. So <laughs> uh, what about languages and relationships with people in positions of, of authority? Uh, I know you are learning Italian because you need to deal with the Italian consulate. In what ways does it limit you uh, not to be able to speak Italian uh, well yet? Oh, it's really limiting. Um, yeah, so I'm, before I naturalized as an American, I had my whole life an Italian nationality. And um, because I was born in a really remote area, some paperwork was lost. And so now I'm being denied that. and. Um, the truth of it is like Italians are very much like if you can't speak the language and you're going to the consulate, you're not going to be treated seriously, you know, so it makes the whole situation and it's probably the situations already like tougher because of like politics and and just like this negation of like, well, you're not Italian. So um, one of the yeah, I, I started learning Italian because it was like, I at least have to know how to talk about my situation <laughs> in Italian and um, and not be like overlooked or talked under, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask you one more question. Okay. While, while <laughs> we wait, uh, where are our students? We have a few students here. And I would like to hear questions from them. Kimberly, we have, we have, we have Joseph. 
y Amani. Hi, Amani. She's my student. I saw her this morning. Uh, cool. Audrina, Tami, Orom. If you guys have any questions, please add them in the chat. Um, so yeah, the, the next question I was going to ask is that you have mentioned uh, Spanish, English, Italian. Uh, what is your first language, second language, third language, in your opinion? Um, so it's a toss up, like in terms of, of, of when I learned a language, um, I learned Spanish first and then I learned English. But the truth of it is because I spent like all my education is English. I have much, I'm more confident in terms of like vocabulary, writing, talking about my art in English over Spanish. But um, like I said, the, the times that I have lived in, in Spanish speaking countries have been like an immense help um, for my own language acquisition and feeling comfortable. And, and usually it takes me like three to five days where I, I'm like, like in Mexico, Mexico is crazy. They have a million words for the same thing and they're all funny and they all have, where you're like, you're what? And it like, yeah, you just like tutter across the first three to five days and then it's like, okay, I know what I'm doing, <laughs> you know. That's probably the same I feel when I, every time I come back to, to the US, the <laughs> yeah. days to, to get back yeah. to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we have another question here from Audrina Mulan. Mulan. Uh, I'm not sure if you've traveled to many other states, he's asking within, within the United States, but I'm curious if you have noticed things that are unique to Nebraska compared to other states. I'm not sure if he's, if he's asking in general or in terms of language, but I guess you can answer about both, both aspects. I guess I'm going to... I think about language first and um yeah I mean there's obvious things like things that Nebraskans say like oak or yeah no or those little um colloquial things um I always think I don't have like I always think that like the Midwest and Nebraska has a very neutral um accent but I was talking to someone here in Mexico and she was Texan and she's like oh yeah you have on a Midwestern accent. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think I haven't really, I think it's more noticeable, like if you go to the South, um, when I was in Georgia, like anything that's different to what you're used to hearing is just easier to, to notice. But yeah, I, do, yeah. um, um, I think for me, Spanish has like, because there's such more variety and I think I'm in more contact with people who speak so like come from different countries. So I think I usually notice it more in Spanish because there's, there's more of a learning curve, mm -hmm. I think, in terms of, of tones, of speeds, of words, of, um, yeah. Yeah, I would say actually that that's in, in Spanish, when you go to other parts of the US, it might be that the community of speakers that come from a different country as well. So it's not only the yeah, local absolutely. variety, it's also the yeah. original dialect. Yeah, you know? so you go to Florida and some like a Cuban starts talking, you're like, what? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Or you are going to have, you go to Chicago, you are going to have a big Mexican and Puerto Rican community. Yeah. You go, it's going to depend on, yeah. on that yeah. quite a lot. Okay, so if you don't, if you guys don't have any questions for Roria for now, uh, I see that Marta Sonia is here, so uh, we can go with Marta Sonia. And Roria, if you're gonna stay around, it has okay yeah, with here. you to stay around in case people have questions for you as well later. Yeah, of course. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi Jose. Hi Roria. Hello Marta Sonia. How are you doing? I am very good. A little busy, but happy to be with you today. Awesome, fantastic. Okay, mm -hmm. so I am going to do a you know formal presentation, formal introduction of you, uh, uh -huh. as I did before. So Marta Sonia is our our second uh, guest speaker today, and let me give her a formal introduction as well. So uh, Marta Sonia Londoño Mejia is a Latinx businesswoman based in Omaha. She earned her bachelor's and master's degree in business administration in. Uh, Eafit University? Eafit. 
Yeah, Afid. it's correct, in Colombia. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Afid University in Colombia. She has worked with several business organizations for the advancement and advance, advancement, pardon, uh, of small Latinx business, uh, business, such as Centro Latino or, or the Nebraska Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, uh, among others. And she's now leading Midwest Businesses and Projects, LLC. And, uh, and she's helping Latino businesses in uh, South Omaha. So, Marta Sonia, if you want, you can you can start with a with a brief description of your education, your professional career, and then we can go back and forth with uh, with questions as well. Sure. Uh, you mentioned I am originally from Colombia. I born in Colombia, and uh, forty years of my life I live in Colombia, and uh, I wanted to study the doctorate in the United States is the reason because I am here in USA and specifically in Omaha, Nebraska. In Colombia, my education was all in businesses. You mentioned before, a business administrator. I have a specialization in finance and I, uh, I have an MBA. I love to start businesses. My passion is to work in projects and start businesses. In Colombia, I was teacher, I was professor like you, right now in UNO, in the area of finance and projects. And uh, I had the possibility to develop two projects, hospitals, and this project lasts for many, many years. No, the last project that I lead was um, Las Americas Hospital. Um, was very interesting project, and after that, I wanted to come to the United States to study, no? with the idea to study the doctorate. Uh, I am married uh, and I have children, no? and actually I was married first in Colombia and I, I was divorced uh, with two children. And uh, when I came to the United States, when I was 40 years old, um, I came first without the children. And then after presenting the TOEFL test, uh, I, um, I brought my children to the United States. Mm -hmm. You want that I talk more about that I am doing here at the present or is enough? In the United States, I had the possibility to study too, because uh, in Berkeley, uh, more in, uh, in um, no formal education, I received uh, several programs, like, for example, and business administration. The other was about projects. I had the opportunity to work with the Berkeley University for one year, no? And the English classes in Colombia, because I studied an university, the base was Harvard. Harvard support the studying of this organization. All my cases, all my books were in English. This means that I needed to read and study in English. My third language is Spanish, and of course we talk in, in Spanish all the time, no? But at this time, my reading and my writing was good. My speaking was terrible, and my listening, my hearing was not very good. No, at the present time, the students receive the classes in English in Colombia, but at the time, no, we received the classes in Spanish, but all the material, all the books were in English. For this reason, I studied many years in Colombia English, but one thing is, is, is to be immersed in, in, in the medium, no, where people talk, no. In Colombia, I listen all the time Spanish. When I arrived to the United States, was well, no easy the process. Was very difficult. Yeah, I couldn't understand very well in the first days, but with the time, I learned uh, the idiomatic expression. I was more immersed in the culture. I had been in the United States for 24 years, and right now, still I commit mistakes in English, of course, especially in the pronunciation. It's not easy for me. Yeah, because I live in Colombia 40 years of my life. I was a very old woman when I came to the, the United States, no? But uh, I started working hard and I had read many things in my life here in the United States in, in this beautiful country because I am bilingual. Definitely, this is a great advantage to be bilingual, to talk both languages, Spanish and English. Mm -hmm. Um, if I remember for for what you know you you shared your CV with me and and I looked into it a bit more, um, so it looked like like your organizations that you have been working with or leading uh, here in the U.S. 
they are always connected to the Latino markets or to the Latino population. Um, it has it has always been the case since you have been in the U.S. Yeah, when I arrived to the United States, I started studying first, of course, and uh, I met a, an American, a beautiful American lawyer, and I got married. Yeah, for the second time, I had my three children with him, and I am very happy living with him for many years. Uh, 25 years, actually, no? living with him. Oh. And uh, uh, the, my first job was in Lutheran Family Services. At the time, I was volunteering the organization because I love to work with the immigrants, Latinos. I have some knowledge in computers. My English was not perfect, no, but I, I could help them in some way in this area and in basic education. For the reason uh, I started attending uh, Free Lutheran Church, I am not Lutheran, no, but I attend the area of economic and community development and I start supporting them in, the, in their program. And it was a position in South Omaha to be a coordinator of the social programs of LFS in South Omaha. This was my first position. I was coordinator of the program SAN in South Omaha. And I, I, we opened and we started many, many programs only regarding to businesses, youth programs, for example, after school programs, uh, and of course, computer classes, CSL classes, um, and uh, yeah, social programs in general, no? And because I am business person, I am start talking with the businesses too. Businesses were very close to me and uh, we start help too because they are working in businesses, but they have needs in other areas too. Language is a barrier. They, they they have many, many, many needs in financial and many things. And after that, I was in LFS, I received an invitation to be, or to start the, the Latino Center of Consul Plus. Was not my project. My knowledge was business and some experience in, in social services. I was business person, but I work in social services for the reason they hired me as a, Executive Director at the Latino Center of Consumers, Iowa. I was in the other part of the river, yeah, mm -hmm. working with this beautiful community. And we work in this community for three years. Social services, health, uh, health with Medicare, Medicaid. I learned more, more things in the area of social services working with the Latino Center of Consumers, Iowa. I was there for three years because uh, the businesses of South Omaha called me they wanted to start a chamber of commerce. And uh, I helped them to incorporate and uh, create the Nebraska Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I was the, the first executive director of this organization, and I was there for over three years because my dream was different. My dream was more economic development in general for the community. This was my dream. And uh, yeah, we start working with the Nebraska Hispanic Cham Chamber of Commerce, uh, networking, uh, business education, working with the Latino leadership that work with companies. Because for us, was very important the integration between the different people of the community, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Latinos working with other companies. And uh, uh, being in the Chamber of Commerce, I incorporate another non-profit organization that was my passion, that is Midlands Latino Community Development Corporation, Midland Latino Community Corporation, MLCDC. And I was with this organization for 14 years. That was my baby, no? And we started many, many programs there, for example, or most important target were Latinas. And the first program that we started was a childcare program and we train educators. We train business women that right now, many of them, they have three or four child cares and they are offering bilingual education with all the rules and the norms of the Department of Health and Human Services. We start a community development financial institution at CDFI with the Department of Treasury because there is a great need from immigrants in general and minorities to access to, to lend money to, to, to the bank. They don't have access to, to the banks for, for several reasons. 
yeah, they, this is a new country, they don't have credit score, or the loans are very small to start, for, they don't have loan history. And uh, with this CDFI, it was possible to help our community to obtain loans up to $50,000, yeah? And uh, we refer to other organizations that offer loans with more value. We educate Latinos to go to the banks. And uh, we help many businesses to start and grow. This was the program that we were working in in MLCDC, and we were planning with I lead a commercial kitchen because this incubator of women starting food processing company was important too. Yeah, and uh, I lead MLCDC and uh, start working with the Nebraska Department of Economic Development. I help Didi starting many businesses in, in the state of Nebraska, especially helping them to grow and have access to the tax credits, grants, and other programs that DED have for the community. And then working for the Latino businesses and say, hey, small businesses are important because DED work for the large corporation. This is the reality, you know, and trying that they offer good programs to minorities. Yeah, and then I decided to start my company, you know, uh, my company is, mm, is uh, Midlands Businesses and Projects LLC, uh, and uh, immediately I started my company because I had big companies to assist. The Nebraska Department of Economic Development called me, and they wanted that I was consultant. The idea I started working with DED, no as an employee, as a consultant, and uh, actually I am working in all the states, but I'm, I am more focused in Greater Omaha in the Greater Omaha area. We have several programs right now, for example, we are offering to businesses that are growing in, in employees and sales, a, a training program to help them, to have the knowledge to grow and helping in projects that they are leading right now. Yeah, this is my history in, mm -hmm. in USA uh, regarding to, to the projects that I start. First, I start uh, working with organizations, social services organizations, and then I start working with the with the business organization that we start we create. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I actually wanted to ask you if Midlands was a company or if it was an organization like the ones before. But now I understand. No, it's a non-profit organization, a 501 C3. Mm, I see. Okay. So it's okay, a 501 okay. C3. No, it's not a company, it's a, a, a non-profit organization. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Um so there are two things I wanted to ask you. One is, um, you know, uh, that there was there was a, a project that you were working uh, with with OYAS, with the, uh -huh. the Office of Latino Studies here in UNO, and I kind of participated on that briefly. The students, so, yes, it was fantastic. Well, I, I didn't participate. That is true. My students participated. Uh -huh. exactly. Um, so I I wanted to to see if you got, if you could tell us a, a bit about about that project because I. I I got to to know it firsthand, and it was really really interesting, and with okay. really good results actually. Yeah, excellent results. The situation is, we we needed a plan to work for the economic development of South Omaha because for ARPA fans, great fans are coming to North and South Omaha. And our communities were very affected for the pandemic, and uh, we had the idea to have a, a study in South Omaha. And then we have several objectives, but the most important objectives wa, uh, was to know how the pandemic affect them. And uh, of course, no about the area, the sector that they were working, no more about the employee, employees or jobs that they were creating and the taxes, uh, how they access to the head of the government through SBA, or the DD or other organizations. And we define the objectives uh, with the uh, OJAS. And it uh, was fantastic experience, no? Because we, we we made a partnership with all the organizations that were working for, for Latino businesses, Nebraska Enterprise Fund, uh, was the Greater Omaha Chamber that they have uh, the program REACH, uh, Nebraska Business Development Center from the you know, participate too. Uh, yeah, and the other Midland Latino Community Development Corporation. We invite all them because uh, we needed to, to make a survey to them, to the businesses. 
And uh, the sample that we defined with Ollas was huge, no? We are talking about 150 businesses to interview. Yeah, we didn't have resources, only us working. Uh, and with the help of the partners, the help of Ollas and your students, uh, we have two groups of students of, of the, you know, uh, they came and uh, we went with them and visit the businesses because we were in different ways. The first way was we invite the businesses to Metro Community College and we have the computer that we connect with the organization that serve them and make the questionnaire that last 30 minutes, no? And the students were working with the clients, practicing Spanish and uh, uh, help them to answer the questionnaire, you know? Yeah, uh, after, because we train them to do that. This was one way, and many, many students participate in that, no? Other way was with phone calls, we made phone calls and we have appointment in my office and they interview the student there. And the other way was we knocked doors and we went to the different businesses. I was with them, of course. Yeah, because they know me, no? And, uh, but after knowing them, they interview the students inside of the store. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we have the, the conclusion of the study uh, last year was very important for the program that the, the offer to the community and the resources. No, right now we have more access to the money of the state for this study that we made. A nonprofit organization uses two that are focused in businesses to write grants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was the experience that we have with your students. I think the students lead a lot and we live from them too. And we are very grateful, no, because I remember there were two groups and around 60 students, no, or 50, I don't remember exactly. I believe it was 15 and 20. Ah, we're, not, we're Maybe, at 35. See, yeah, I think it was, the numbers were, were around there between 35 and 40, if I okay. remember correctly. Yeah. No, no I, I, I was very happy to somehow be part of that because, you know, like, mm. You you get the you get a big corporation can get those numbers super easily. It's, it's, it's a lot easier for them to get a report like this done and and receive a lot of money. But for small businesses, it's a lot harder. So yeah, so you yeah, know. they did an excellent job. But the, yes. you have one group or two. I had one group. The other one was the group Wait, by other, other professor Steven yeah. Torres. Yes. Steven Torres. Yes. Steven Torres. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you. One question that I asked the, to Oria the exact same way. So mm -hmm. how being monolingual in only in English or only in Spanish would have made your career differently? Okay, if, for example, like, if I continue uh, talking in Spanish here in the United States, being in the United States, I didn't read my goals. I was possible I will work with a non-profit organization where all the team were talking English, uh, were they, no? And uh, how is possible I will start non-profit organization and write federal grants, state grants and city grants, I work with the banks, with everybody if I don't talk in English. For me, it's easy to talk in Spanish, of course, it's my first language, and a difference with Oria, and I, I didn't receive my education in English. My education, was in Spanish and I was old. For me, it was more difficult. I saw my children, my children are bilingual in, and they talk perfect English and perfect Spanish. Their education were in English, were in English and uh, I talk in Spanish and talk to Colombian movies and uh, I motivate them to be bilingual and they participate in bilingual programs in public schools, no? I always, they all receive dual program, no? They received the classes in English and in Spanish. For them, was great opportunity. Yeah, in my case, it was difficult, and they made fun of me because my pronunciation was terrible. It's, it's, right now, it's, it's bad, but the study was terrible. And uh, still, my husband helped me, no, with my pronunciation. I, I think my my life changed, but for good, mm -hmm. because I had the possibility right now to work in uh, with a diversity. No, not only white people, because I am working with refugees. I work with refugees that they talk in English, Asian people from other countries, no? Yeah, and I go to France and I had the possibility to come in English. In Spanish, it's more difficult that they talk with me, no? English, I think, Spanish is important. 
very important, no? And we can see that more people every day want to learn Spanish, no? But English is universal. If you go to England or you go to France or you go, you are to other Canada, you can, you can talk in English, no? In, in Spanish, uh, yes, of course, it's, it's important too. Both are important. I, I love to talk in, in, in Italy, you know, or in French, but for me, in this age, I don't think I will learn, no? For my <laughs> children, I try to motivate that they are, they talk three languages for, or four languages. It's, it's important to talk in different languages. Mm. Now, what if you were monolingual in English? How do you think, like, because your, your collaborations have been a lot, in a lot of cases, or in most cases, has been with the Latino community, specifically. Mm -hmm. So if you were only speaking English, how do you think that would have Many barriers. Different? Many barriers to fulfill my, my goal. Because uh, many of the, there are, in relation to, to Latino, there are second, third generation, these people talking English, and they are from this culture. But the new immigrants, there are a lot of people, because it's incredible the amount of people that are Latino that are living here in the United States. There are two things. One, the language. If I talk in English with them, it will be easier in the process to explain, to convince, to empower them. And the other thing is that it's good for me, the culture because they are very jealous and scared about these barriers that you have when you are a new country, no? Yeah, when I am with them, uh, when they know me, in, especially, ah, they are from other countries. For example, I am Colombia, and I work with a lot of Mexicans or people from Honduras or Nicaragua, Guatemala. In the first time, there is a barrier because I am no Guatemala, I, I am no Mexican, they are scared, and there are differences between us. But when they can see that this trust, this trust is very important to work with the Latino community, that people trust in you. You need to gain that. You need to get, and if you are American and you talk in English, you, you can reach this goal, no? But if you talk in Spanish, it will be easier. And if you know about the culture and living in our countries, more easier. So I'm going to, uh, as I said before, you guys can start writing your questions uh, in the chat. In the meantime, because you know, they will probably need a minute to, to think it. Uh, I would like to ask you one more. It's just that uh, I'm very interested on that. So uh -huh. you mentioned that you were a professor. You used to be a professor. And I still, I still I am a professor. I love to teach. Okay. I, I don't need to participate in my classes in this in the program that we offer. For example, where in MLCC where we start the childcare is a training with certification and have the certification oh, of the I Department okay. of Health and Human Services. In the business area, strategic planning, I love to teach that. Right now in this program, the name is El, El Latino Business Expansion Program. I teach the section of the strategic planning and I participate in the coaching, individual coaching, helping them with these areas, no? Still I teach, but in the past I was full-time teacher mm -hmm. and I teach finance, uh, uh, um, uh, economic engineer, I, I finance, uh, accounting, yeah, administrative accounting, yeah. Full but time, you, I work full time. But it seems like you are still teaching. I don't know. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. No, I, I didn't know you were still teaching or still coaching. Yeah, in, in the past was in university. Mm -hmm. I was in universities 100% and I work in research and I teach. But uh, here is is more more uh, informal because I am not in an university, but I but still we wo work with a lot of uh, with yeah we assist them with a lot of discipline no and they need to study and uh, bring homework yeah to participate in the program. Mm. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I don't see any additional questions in the in the chat. Oh, we got one. Okay. Oh, okay. It's, this is for, for Oria. I was, actually, I was actually going to say that uh, we can open up the, the Q&A now for, for, for both Oria and Marta Sonia. Uh, while we receive a few other questions, I would like to ask you one more question uh, to the two of you, uh, which is, you know, for, for some of the students that are here today, uh, or for most of them, I would, I would even say, uh, Spanish is not their, their first language or, or the, la the language that they are learning because uh, we have French and German students as well. It's not their first language, uh, but they are studying that, that, that second language. Uh, what is 
some piece of advice, and it can be educational, it can be professional, it can be uh, whatever way you guys can think of. What piece of advice would you give to, to these students who are focusing on language as one important part of their education? Who want to start or you want to start? Um, I guess uh, to clarify, we're not talking about like learning the language, but how can we use language as a as like a tool for yes yeah yes I'm 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 asking the question very broad. If you want okay. to take it that way, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, what what would you like to answer, or what do you want me to go? Marta Sonia. Okay. My advice is learn five languages if you can. If you manage other languages, you manage the world. You are international. You have the possibility to know many places, read incredible books, have the possibility to work in many places. It's very important to learn other languages. In the past, I thought that living in Colombia, in my circle, no, always I thought that English was important because I was a business person, no? And I say, I need to learn English. But if I learn other languages, oh my God, what I can do, especially when I will be retired or right now that I am working, this, this I will have more opportunities if I learn other language. And my advice is try to go to other countries no other cultures because it's no other no only to learn the language is how these people live I try, try to understand for what for what reason they live in this way because when we don't know about the some culture we criticize and we say we, we say oh well, this is, is a little weird no for example when i came here to the united states i said oh my god how much discipline these people have it's incredible they are very strict rigid for me it was it was difficult to to be in that, but I understand the importance to, to be on time, 15 minutes before the time, no? Because in, in, in Colombia, when many places people are right late, and this is no professional, no? It's very important try to understand other cultures. If you will if be immersed in this culture, try to learn, no? How in vacation or if you were in other places, try to meet with other people. Yeah, this is my advice. Um, oh yeah, that, that that was such an awesome answer. I don't know how you can. <laughs> I know, I know. Right. Well, I mean, I think I I I think I would only build up on that um, by saying that um, language is a way to connect to people. So when you when you speak a language, you you are creating like a conversation, and you and you, like a, a physical conversation, like an actual conversation. But what you're also communicating is like a respect, an interest in that person's identity, like we're so um, tied to our country, our culture, the flag, and like all those things are things that when you embark on learning language, you also um, um, learn. And so, and so one, on one end, you're like connecting and you're creating these conversations. And on the other end, like, like personally, as you go through the struggles of learning a language, like it's never gonna be easy um, it's never gonna like one day you're great and one day you're like I can't do this and I think that's also like really powerful because you're putting yourself in the spots like especially for people who are English speakers we um, and I see this like I see this a lot too when when I, when when I travel is that is that there's like this expectancy that other people are going to speak English and I don't have to make any effort you know I just like repeat it to you in English. So I think like it's really important to have that experience where you're struggling and you're like, how do I, how do I not sound like a three-year-old? Like all those things are really important for our own growth. And um, so, yeah, I, I think it's great. It doesn't have to be something that you, you, you do professionally. It can be something that you um, are like, well, I want to, and I think in like, I'm and like, and like Marta said, like, nothing is ever going to be being in that country. So maybe you're learning basic Vietnamese to go to Vietnam and your experience will be immensely richer and people are going to be more open to you because they're going to see you like butchering the word for bathroom, but they're going to, they're going to be like grateful for that too. So, yeah. Absolutely. I, I just wanted to add because you, you mentioned the, 
that when you become multilingual, multicultural, you unlearn your connection to a place or your connection to a flag or your, and I, I I remember hearing somewhere, I don't remember where, where it was, that when you become multicultural, you somehow see the matrix. Like all of a sudden, things don't have to be that way. Things can be this way or can be this other way. Uh, and just being aware of the flexibility comes with 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 learning a, a new language and, and becoming part of a new culture, you know. Another thing that I didn't mention is to respect the diversity. If I understand other, I can respect the diversity because sometimes we don't understand it for this one, we, we don't accept, no? This is the other point. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So here in the chat, we have a question uh, for Oria from uh, Joseph Leahi. Uh, so how did you go about marketing, publishing your artwork? Is, uh, is it anything like publishing a book or was it more independent? Um, definitely more independent. Um, depending on sort of like what your interests are as like a career. So there are ways like if I had more interest in working with galleries then I would be reaching out to like more established organizations. Um, but you can also just like run it. Some people are super successful with the social media and Instagram. So, um, I mean, we live, I mean, in the world that we live in with, you know, you just, you have to have a Facebook and you probably have to have a more or less decent website. Um, and Instagram, Instagram is probably the strongest still, to be honest. Um, yeah. And, and it, I, I try and take it like, easiest like it's it's like a business card but it isn't like a reflection of who you are as an artist or where your work is or you don't need sometimes it's hard to feel like I need to make something just to show it to other people when you just need to make something to to make something so marketing kind of can be a double-edged sword knife or however you say it you know yeah in, in what language do you go for marketing um, I generally go mainly in English, okay. um, but but yeah, one of the things is is like I'm gonna start probably doing both. But it honestly it takes so much time to like think of the photos, the posts, and whatever. Like usually by the time I'm there, I'm like I get lazy and to translate into Spanish. But yeah, it's important. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a very nice last step, right? To what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So I guess I guess we can extend the same the same you know question on marketing and what I'm adding about the language for Marta Sonia. Yeah, in uh, my case, direct marketing is very important. El, to contact people, no, through networking, and in, I I participate in a lot a lot of networking activities. The past the ref uh, the refers clients. For me, it's very important, no, because I have been working in, in businesses for uh, 17 years. They refer, ah, call Marta Sonia to this phone number. I have the, many refers. Uh, social media, as you mentioned, is very important. Uh, and uh, my all my social media, my website, for example, is bilingual in English and in Spanish because I have the, the two markers, no. And in my social media, I try that will be bilingual, but it's more mass Spanish than English because my target is more Latinos, no? That talking Spanish and they, I think that you you offer services is according to your target. What is your target? If your target is more Americas, you need to offer the information in, in, in English. I use a lot of Facebook. Instagram is very important, but for the age of my clients, all people like me use more Facebook. Young people use more Instagram, yeah? And with the person that sees me in in, business, in the social media, we will start uh, with TikTok and others. Yeah, but- with TikTok, uh, very nice. Yeah, we will start using that. But uh, in my case, it's uh, direct marketing. I use a lot of emails to contact my clients. Latinos clients require phone call. The, unfortunately, they are with more direct contact phone calls and text. Mm -hmm. I am more efficient communicating by text, using text. 
Uh, Marta Sonia, you have mentioned your website a second ago, and uh, Oria and uh, uh, shared her website. I'm going to post it here again. Uh, do you want to share your website on the chat also, just in case someone sure. wants to check it? Sure, it's www.midwest businesses plural projects plural dot com. Um, I wrote it there. Please let me know if I uh, if I miss a spell. Something. Okay. Okay. Midwest businesses, businesses projects dot projects com. plural dot mm -hmm. com. Yeah, I think that is where I type. Uh, guys, if if you if you try that link and it doesn't work, then you have to <laughs> to work my spelling. Yeah, bit. and it's very simple. No, I have my homepage talk about the services that uh, my company offers. I have a section of news. I promote a lot of help from the government, from the different offices, Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Economic Development, grants and tax credit and, and many things, a special program for, for the businesses. And I have a, a section that is uh, to talk about businesses, no? It's a highlight mm -hmm. in this first page. And uh, then uh, is the page of, of about us, where uh, is the vision, the mission, the values, and uh, I am the person that I assist in the business, for example, my, my resume too, in English and in Spanish, all is bilingual. And the last page is very important because our resources uh, are all the offices of the government, all uh, and, uh, the, the state, uh, and with links to go to, to programs, to application, and I assist them and refer directly to the resources. And the last page, all the organizations that offer uh, services in English and in Spanish in the Greater Omaha. And for this organization, we report the services that they offer, who can attend them, and the phone number. That's this really direct directory is very important for them. Mm -hmm. It's very simple, no? But uh, this is my work. That's mm -hmm. really good. Thank you. Um, so yeah, do you? Uh, I'm going to adjust uh, one more time. Audrina, I'm just trying to see who who all the students are here. Audrina, Jonas, Joseph, Amani, Tammy, Otom. Do you guys have any any last questions? I don't think I have any questions, but I just I I love learning. Spanish I just love languages in general so I liked when you both were saying like that not only is learning languages good but but just when the people whose native language you're learning when they see that you are trying to learn like you gain a trust there and it's not it's not just about oh I'm gonna just learn this language for fun like you you really are trying to communicate with people and build that trust and I, I just really like that you both said that. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I guess absolutely. I sorry. Okay. <laughs> so I think Oria was going to respond, and then we had Autumn and Audrina, I think, in that order. Okay, Oria. I, I was just going to say absolutely that um, people um, really respect that and respond to that, and you don't have to um, ever feel like you, you, you know, like all the mistakes, all of the, like, just communicating and, and just think of, like, you know, children communicate and we can, we can communicate in other languages the way children do. And, and that's okay. Like no one's going to think, oh, people only think like better of you for that, that you're still trying for, to. For even trying, that is true. Yeah, yeah. Because everyone knows how scary it is. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Otom, I think you had a question. Yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt. Um, no, it's okay. I guess <laughs> I just want to like give you a slight backstory so my question makes a little more sense. Um, so I took three years of Spanish in high school, but I did not pay attention at all, which I definitely regret. But so now I'm back in Spanish again. But I guess I'm just like curious. I know you gave advice on like, like what Spanish does and how it changes your opportunities and stuff. But I guess I'm kind of curious, like, if anyone has any ideas on your best approach to like, start the conversation like real world conversation like with spanish speakers in the workplace because i have a lot of like patients that are spanish speaking only so what's the best way to approach like 
trying to learn the language within the workplace instead of just like reading vocabulary and putting it into a sentence. That's a good one. Very Absolutely. Good. Yeah. Uh, in the past, I, I had access to a book and uh, the object of this book was to learn conversation or uh, uh, word in conversation with a lot of grammar, no? <laughs> and hella lot is incredible. For example, hi, how are you? Hola, como estas? And in this way, people, it's very funny because when you are adult, you try to learn first grammar and then speaking, word speaking and the reading. But look how children learn, children how learn. Listening because they don't, they don't know how to read. It's listening and seeing, no? I remember my boy when I, he was here, he didn't talk nothing of English. And with a neighbor with sounds, they play. And uh, in three months, he was talking. He was talking a little bit and with cartoons. I selected the cartoons and with cartoons. In six months, he was bilingual, in six months, because he was three years old, no? Yeah, I think to have a conversation, a conversation partner is the best way. Of course, to read grammar and uh, look for a good course is important, no? Both. But to, to have a conversation partner that work with you and read with you, answer question with you will, will be excellent way. I learn more in this way. I was in UNO with the ESL classes, yeah, for uh, and the class for businesses and was very useful for me to learn the grammar and the reading and use the laboratories, etc, etc, etc. But then I consider that I need more because I was 40 years old and my 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 head didn't work very easy, no? And the conversation partner, I have a conversation partner, a, a lady that was was teacher of the Metropolitan College and she helped me a lot. And in one year after that, I was, I learned more. I know I am not completely bilingual, but I learn more with the conversation partner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think conversations are are like the most important and most valuable thing that you can do to learn. And um, my advice is like, like nothing works like the weather or um, depending on like how how comfortable you are. Because I know this is a work place, but if you have more of a relationship with these with the person or whoever. Um, yeah, anything that starts a small conversation, like, how are you? How's the weather? Um, what have you been watching on Netflix? Like, it's really funny. I, I started watching like The Last of Us and like every person I talk to here in Mexico is like watching The Last of Us. So it's, there's like a lot of things that, um, you know, depending on how like comfortable you are with the language, but yeah, small talk is always the best way to start. <laughs> never wrong with it and um i wanted to add something to that uh which is that yeah small talk always works but i i would i would say and maybe i'm generalizing i'm making a generalization here about all all, all of the hispanic or spanish-speaking cultures right which these generalizations don't always completely work but i i would say that there are there are topics that maybe in the north american a culture are too personal that in in a spanish speaking culture are not that personal and i'm thinking just asking where someone is from um asking about someone's family um and i think those topics when you are speaking in spanish i believe they are also welcome and also acceptable Oria, Oria is uh, going like this. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Right? Yeah, for sure. And it's usually things that we learn early on in classes, so you should feel more or less comfortable yeah. talking about your family. <laughs> mm -hmm. If not, it's a great way to learn. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Odrina, I think you also have one question. Uh, so um, first, I'm going to say thank you. I The initial question um, that I did have, actually, Autumn kind of touched on, and I wanted to just expand on it just a tad. Um, so I have taken a little bit of Spanish, just as some background, and then um, my family, they all speak it. 
Interesting. And I just didn't pick it up because we moved to the States and then just didn't use it at all. Um, so now as a provider, I actually want to do services in Spanish. So I feel like I'm kind of starting from square one. And so part of my question is, you know, in terms of just being at home, are there recommendations on, you know, particular shows to watch or things to just kind of expose myself, kind of thinking of I don't even kids shows just to start to pick up the language a little bit. And then the second question I also have is that it just kind of understanding the Omaha community a little bit better. Um, so, you know, having lived in California and Southern California, there's a lot of individuals from Tijuana. And so, you know, there's a lot of unique things to the community. And so I'm curious about Omaha and anything you can share that might make us unique here um, as I, you know, kind of start to get a little bit more involved with services. Um, I think um, for like the first part of your question, anything that you can, um, like any input that you can add to your day to day is always going to be great. And like sometimes um, it's like a show, but sometimes I feel like shows require like a lot of concentration from me. I like, I like podcasts. There's like a whole like easy Spanish, easy German that you can just put on and like, sometimes I'll just walk and I'll like half listen. Um, but if your family speaks it, I mean, I'm sure like if a family member wants to like, you can, you can, <laughs> you can kind of force them to talk to you for like 15 minutes. Like I usually, um, I always think it's better like 10 minutes a day versus like three hours one day. So it's like little by little is usually the best um, in my experience. And as for like the Omaha, I think, I think there's definitely a lot of um, people from Mexico. I don't know if they're super North, they might be, you know, I think a mix. And then like Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. Um, but I think there's also, you know, a variety of people from other countries. I feel like maybe Marta might have more personal experience. I've, I've for sure, um have have you know like um, interacted with a lot of people from Guatemala and Mexico um but yeah that's like as far as I comfortably could <laughs> say I don't know <laughs> yeah oh yeah but but you are you are right the majority of uh, Latinos that are in Omaha uh, and Nebraska are from Mexico we will say 94 percent the following group is Guatemalans the group of Guatemalans here in, in the United States is huge. Uh, Salvador, Salvador is another group that is important. Uh, and uh, Cubans are coming a lot. Cubans and people from Venezuela are, com are, are coming a lot uh, for uh, the problems of the country, no? They are refugees in some way. Uh, and uh, aside here in, in, in the state of Nebraska for the reason in, in some areas of Nebraska, for example, in Grand Island, we can see a lot of people from Cuba. Yeah, but the group more important are Mexicans, in, in Guatemala, Salvador, Puerto Ricans. We have some Puerto Ricans too. Our community is small, but it's growing. It's especially the professional group is growing a lot. Yeah, yeah. You can you can see many countries, but the most important is the four for groups that I mentioned before. And if you want to contribute, that was the second part. There are a lot of ways that you can contribute and be immersed in organizations, social services organizations that can help that work with Latinos. For example, Latino Center of the Midlands, they have beautiful programs that work with youth in high school and uh, with universities and uh, with families. Um, all depend on that you, what these are your strengths and uh, what is your passion? Yeah, if you want to serve, contact me and I will contact you with a lot of people in, in South Omaha or directly in, in my project. We have a lot of projects where we need people that are bilingual or want to learn Spanish. Mm -hmm. Marta Sonia can get you in touch with anyone in South Omaha. <laughs> <laughs> She's the person to go to. <laughs> 
All right, do we have any last questions? All right, guys, so thank you very much. Uh, you know, I, I just scheduled one and a half hours and uh, it may it may seem like a lot of time, but you see it's almost 5.30. <laughs> it always happens like that. We we end up having enough conversation for, for a good chunk of time. So thank you, Oria. Thank you, Marta, Sonia. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, guys. And for anybody else, uh, we will keep uh, we will uh, let you guys know about the next uh, uh, event in the series, which is going to probably be in the fall already. But uh, we will keep keep you all posted. So thank you guys, and I will see you next time.